Between 10.30 p.m. and midnight, on April the 15th last, a woman was strangled. Earlier that same evening, at the Covent Garden Opera House in London, a large audience was gathering for the first performance of a new opera. These two facts are not entirely unconnected, for the murdered woman and the man who is now accused of her murder were both in the theater that night. To most of the audience, it was an evening like many others. But to the accused man, it was something more than that. Very much more than that. Nicholas Talbot was an ambitious man, but for many years, fortune had eluded him. When he married a promising young opera singer and became her business manager, he believed that at last he had set his foot on the ladder to success. Why do you have to change everything at the last moment? If this ever doesn't shut up, I shall scream. Nick, why didn't you come before? Where have you been? Counting the tiaras, Doc. Good evening, Signor Peroni. Good evening, Mr. Talbot. I am telling her, if you leave it to me, everything will be all right. Now the overture starts in two minutes. So if you will forgive me, good luck, Signor Peroni. Thank you, Mr. Talbot. Lady Pratt's here. Remember her? Can. Magnificent bust, blazing with jewels. Nick, I've had nerves before, but never like this. Nonsense. You're always like this until you start but to But tonight, sing. it's so very important to us. If I flop this you time... Course, I... Why should you flop this time? Because it's my first time in London, because I'm terrified, because I've forgotten everything. I expect I'll sing Butterfly by mistake. Nick, put your arms around me very tight and tell me I shan't sing Butterfly by mistake. Well, Lady Pratt wouldn't notice if you did. She might stop talking just long enough to ask why you went in a Japanese costume, but that's about all. What about the critics? Oh, it would take more than that to get them out of the bar. <laughs> it's the aria that worries me. Peroni keeps altering the tempo. Now, has Peroni ever let you down? No, never, bless him. Very well, then. Three minutes, please, Miss Shelley. Now for it. Off you go and keep your fingers crossed. Wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten. All right now? Yes, I'm all right. Sure? Sure. Nick. How's everything? Splendid. I say, this is a ringside seat. How did you manage it? Influence. I know the stars like it. I expect she's nervous. A bit, but she never really flies off the handle till it's all over. And when she does, what do you do? Duck. <laughs> It so happened that I was in the audience that night. Little did I realize then how closely I was later to be associated with the tragic events that were to follow. opera drew to its close, Talbot sat unaware of the presence of the woman whose death was to involve him so deeply. She too had chosen music for a career.
I just can't tell you what I feel about it. Yes, honestly, Philippa, it was quite lovely. I've never heard you sing better. Very creditable, Philippa. Most adequate performance. I'm not sure I'm talking to you. You walked out in the middle of the aria. You shouldn't have been looking. I wasn't. Leslie told me. Oh, just maddening. Oh, I had a Philippa, call. Philippa, right darling, you're wonderful. I couldn't have enjoyed it more. How proud you must be of her, Nick. Yes, I am, very. We really must go, Philippa, or we shall lose that train. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed myself. And you have too, haven't you, Leslie? It was withered up, Philippa. I enjoyed it very much. I could see it was awfully good music. <laughs> I'll get you a taxi, John. It's pouring with rain. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Good night, dear. A few minutes later, as Talbot was returning to the dressing room... Nicky! Nicky! Nicky, I do believe you were going to cut me dead. No, I wasn't. I just didn't recognize you. Have I changed all that much? No, not a bit, but... After all, it's a long time. Yes, it is, isn't it? What are you doing here? Playing in the orchestra. I didn't see you at rehearsal. No, somebody went down with flu. I got the job at the last moment. What were you doing at rehearsals? Shifting scenery. Nicky, not really. Well, that's a joke, I suppose. What are you doing here? Well, just at the moment, I'm waiting for Philippa. Philippa Shelley? Oh. She's my wife, you know. No, I didn't know. You've gone up in the world. But you were always lucky. Yes, I have been lucky. I hope things have been good for you, too. Me? I've had one smack in the eye after another. Oh, I'm sorry. But you don't want to hear about it, naturally. Hard luck stories are always boring. Oh, not at all. If there's anything I could do... There's a lot you could do if you want to. Couldn't we meet somewhere? I've got so much to tell you. If I gave you my address, would you look me up? Well, I, I, I'll try. That means you won't. Oh, well, I don't blame you after five years. No, I will try, really, but I must go now, Elizabeth. Really, I must. You are? Scribble the address on this. Look, here's a pencil. It's just off the Euston Road. I'm on the first floor. I'm afraid it's not much of a place. Nicky, I need you badly. You will come, won't you? Yes, why don't we all have lunch somewhere? It's lovely. Well, here you are. I wondered where you'd got to. I'm sorry, darling. I ran into an old friend. Good night, Philippa. Good night. Good night, Nick. Good night. Elizabeth, may I introduce you to my wife, or, or have you met already? No, we haven't met. How do you do, Miss uh, Russman, Elizabeth Russman? How do you do, Miss Shelley? I had no idea you were Nicky's wife. Do you mind if I drag him away? You'll excuse us, won't you, Elizabeth? Yes, of course. Good night, Miss Shelley. I'm glad to have met you. I'm glad to have met you. Well, you've really done it, my darling. You were never better. Yes, it all went off wonderfully well, didn't it? She's rather attractive, isn't she? Who? Oh. Elizabeth. Nicky. Oh, yes, in a way. I snooped round the bar in the interval. Everyone was raving about you. She must have been one of your early conquests. So early, I've forgotten all about her. Is that why you were taking her address? No, I didn't want her address. I couldn't very well refuse it, could I? Now, how about dropping the subject? I'm sorry you find it so embarrassing. Not in the least embarrassing. Merely idiotic. I never knew you had such a jealous nature. I never knew you had such a past. As far as I'm concerned, Elizabeth Rusman's dead and buried. The whole thing finished years ago. Then there was a thing. Well, I never led you to suppose you were the first woman in my life. You married me with your eyes open, you know. Perhaps it'll be as well if I keep them open. You'll imagine far more than you see. Pour me out a nice large drink. I deserve it. I didn't need it so badly myself. I'll give you the entire bottle. Now bring them in there. Nick, lend me a pencil. Funny. Should be here. Huh? Well, I seem to have lost it. Perhaps Elizabeth Rossman still got it. All right, you are. Yes, well, here's to your success this evening. And yours. How long did you know her? Oh, Elizabeth? Oh, about three months. Only three months. Anything strange in that? No. Only seems a very short time for such a violent love affair. Does it? No, I don't think so. Anyway, it wasn't particularly violent. Just one of those low-spirited little affairs that drag on and on, I suppose. It didn't drag on. Didn't it? Yet, after five years, you had to rush out in the middle of the last act just because you'd seen her. Even if I had seen her, what good would it have done me to rush out, as you call it, when she was busy fiddling away in the orchestra? 
That's what I'm wondering. I tell you, I went out on business. Business? Yes, business. Couldn't it have waited? What? I said, couldn't it have waited? No, it couldn't. Did she uh, send you a note or something? Now, listen, Philip, I know it's only reaction. You get these queen wasp fits after a big strain, but will you please put me on the carpet for something else and lay off this topic because I don't like it? I see you don't like it. I can't think why if it's all supposed to be over. Well, of course it's over, but that sort of meeting's always embarrassing. Is it? I would have thought you would have found out some sort of technique for it by now. You any good at mathematics? No, why? I've been working it out. We've been back in England three weeks. If we meet one discarded mistress every three weeks, that'll work out nearly 20 a year, won't it? There are times, Philippa, when you're extremely irritating. No wonder you arrange those foreign tours. For the love of heaven, shut up! <gasps> Nick! Nick, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to hit you. I am sorry. Please let me look, darling. Please let me look. Kindly leave me alone. Where are you going? Nicholas Talbot and his wife are the only two people who know for certain the truth of what happened in their flat that night. Did that quarrel take place or not? Husband and wife have both at various times told different stories. But the Crown is not so much concerned with what happened then as with what happened later. It will set before you the chain of events, the sinister accumulation of small but indisputable facts which form the sum of the evidence against the man standing in that dock. Nicholas Talbot is charged with murder, and I shall invite you to come to the conclusion, upon the evidence to be given, that he is guilty of murder. <coughs> At 10.15 on April the 15th, he returned to his apartment accompanied by his wife. Twenty minutes later, he was seen leaving the building again, this time alone. It is the Crown's submission that the accused, when he left his home, proceeded immediately to Rathlin Mansions, the lodgings of Elizabeth Russell. was seen to enter the building. The landlady had gone to the pictures. Her husband, George Greve, had stayed in until 10.30, then he too went out. Greve will tell you that he was away for approximately 30 minutes, the vital 30 minutes during which the crime took place. There is bound to be a certain amount of conjecture as to what occurred in the murdered woman's bedroom during those 30 minutes. She cannot tell us because she is dead and Talbot denies ever having been there. But it is probable that there was an argument and it is probable that this argument became heated. As far as one thing is concerned, however, there is no conjecture. Between 10.45 and 11.15 p.m., a man entered Elizabeth Russman's apartment and attacked her. of the crowd. That man was Nicholas Talbot.
out for man wanted in connection with alleged murder. Seen leaving 216 Rathlin mansions at approximately 23.05 hours. Dressed in brown filthy hat and raincoat. May have injury to forehead. What can I do for you? I wonder if you can help me. I've cut my head and it won't stop bleeding. I'll do my best. Would you mind coming under this light? Lucky to find you open. I've tried about five already. Oh. Quite a deep cut. Is you fallen? Down some steps. Perfectly sober, too. I'm afraid this will need a couple of stitches. A bit beyond me. Why don't you go to the Fitzroy Street Hospital? It's only just round the corner. Oh, can't you just stop it bleeding? Or leave you the nasty scar. Oh, very well. Second on the left. About a hundred yards down. Thanks. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Strangled. Dead about 20 minutes. Might be difficult to identify. Fortunately, that won't be necessary. How long has she been with you? Two weeks. Maybe three. The old woman would know. This man you saw coming down the stairs, you say he was wearing a soft hat and a raincoat. Would you recognize him again? Well, I didn't see his face all that plain, but I think I'd know him again. Well, couldn't you see what sort of injury? Was it a scratch, a cut, a broken I tell bone? you, I didn't see it. How could I see it when he kept his handkerchief before it all the time? Is there a telephone in the house? There's one next door. Slip next door and phone that description to the station. Have it circulated to all hospitals and chemists in the area. Yes, sir. And tell them to send up the photographers and a couple more men. Yes, sir. Thanks. Is this your first accident casualty? Good heavens, no. What makes you think, sir? Well, you're so young. You've only been at it very long. Over six weeks now. Think you've made a good job of it? Lovely. I couldn't have done better than this if I got my fellowship. It's the prettiest job as ever I saw. No glass in the wound, by the way. How did it happen, you say? Taxi skidded and hit a lamp standard. It's lucky you didn't overturn. I was in a little MG Sports once on the Brighton Road. We were taking a corner at about 68 when a tire burst. You're wanted on the phone. Who, me? Well, you're in charge, aren't you? Uh, who wants me? Uh, is this a lady? They didn't say. Oh. Well, anyway, we skidded twice round, went through a gate and ran into a cow. Of course, that stopped us dead. It was as pretty a piece of driving as ever I saw. Excuse me. What happened to the cow? Oh, the farmer was insured. Is that the doctor in charge? This is Fitzroy Lane Police Station. We're circulating a description of a man suffering from a head injury to the left temple. Uh, height about five foot ten, well built, probably under forty, wearing brown trilby hat and raincoat. What? You go in there now. Oh, good. Hold the line a minute, please. Hello? The yard of phone back, sir. There's a man answering to that description being treated at the Fitzroy Street Hospital now. They've got the doctor holding on. Tell them to ask the doctor to keep the man there as long as possible. And I'll come around at once. Right. Keep him here? How? Yes, I know, but... Well, if you say so, but tell him to hurry. Yes, all right. Goodbye. Anything important? Huh? Uh, oh, no, no, thank you very much. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, where was I? You just killed a cow, and if you don't mind, I'll be getting along. Uh, just a minute. I, uh, I think I ought to take just one more look, don't you? Uh, let me see. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just coming through there a bit. I, um, I think I'd better put a little more wool on, just to keep it quite dry. Uh, give me another bit of plaster, nurse. But don't you think... Give me another bit of plaster. Don't forget, I want to get my hat on. Well, the best thing you can do is to go straight home in a taxi. No, I'll walk. It's stopped raining. Oh, oh, no, no, you shouldn't do that. I'll, uh, I'll phone for a taxi. Well, thanks all the same. I'd like to get some air. Uh, just a minute. There's a frayed end. I'll cut it off for you. 
Do I pay for this? No, thanks. We're a free hospital. There's a box at the gate if you feel inclined. Oh, right. Thanks. Another casualty? Yes, it looks like being a busy night. Right, I'll make way for the next case. Good evening. You, Dr. Harris? Yes, I, uh, you phoned and I thought... Thanks, very good of you. Uh, just a moment, sir. Oh, do you want me? We're checking up on accident cases. Can you give us a few details of what happened? You have been in a car crash, haven't you? Only a slight one, nothing to bother about. Was it a taxi? Yes. I see you've been hurt, though. It was the glass. Where did this happen, Mr... Talbot. Uh, Mr. Talbot. Oh, not far from here, near the Euston Road. Was it reported to the police? Well, I really couldn't tell you. I expect it was. Uh, uh, just a moment. Were you going home when the accident occurred? Does it matter? It does, rather. Well, yes, I was. Where had you been? I don't find this very funny. Have you any reason for questioning me? As a matter of fact, we have. Have you ever seen this before? Looks like a photograph of me. Doctor, would you insist to mind leaving us a moment? No, of course not. Thank you. Does that locket belong to Elizabeth Rusman? It did. What's happened to her? Mr. Talbot, do you still maintain that you got that injury in a car accident? We can easily check up, you know. No, of course not. Why didn't you tell me it was something serious? What's happened to her? All in good time. Tell us first how you got that injury. Well, as a matter of fact, I got it at home. My wife. You married, by the way? No. Well, pity you'd understand better if you were. My wife threw something at me. She didn't mean to hit me, but of course it did. We'd had a quarrel, nothing serious, but not the sort of thing one wants to talk about. I think the best thing, Mr. Talbot, would be for you to put it in the form of a statement. This, members of the jury, is the statement made and signed by the prisoner that night in the presence of Inspector Archer and Detective Kellett. I should like to read you an extract from it. I received this injury in a quarrel with my wife. It was a very stupid quarrel, and no doubt I was very irritating. She threw something at me and cut my head. I left the flat in a temper. I walked around the streets for half an hour before going into a chemist's shop to get my injury dressed. A very plausible statement, I'm sure. The sort of statement that might come into anybody's mind. But when, in the early hours of the morning, Inspector Archer and Kellett went round to Pelham Court to see Mrs. Talbot, they found no signs of a quarrel. They proceeded to ask her one or two simple questions. Mrs. Talbot, do you know Miss Elizabeth Russman? Yes, slightly. I met her for the first time this evening. Why? What's happened? She's dead. Dead? But I don't understand. Was Nick there? Do you think it's likely? Oh, no, that's impossible. Impossible? Then why did she ask the question? Now, the police had one more fact to elicit. In view of Talbot's statement, a very important fact. There's no kind of uh, quarrel. Oh, no, nothing of that sort. You're sure of that? Quite sure. At that time, she was quite sure. At a subsequent date, as we shall see, she changed her mind. I leave you to draw your own conclusion. Now, what is the next thing the accused man says? I never at any time went near Elizabeth Rusman's flat. But on the following morning, George Green, who was the only man who saw the murderer leave Rathlam Mansions, attended an identification parade. There were eight men lined up at that parade, including the accused. They were all dressed exactly alike, in trilby hats and raincoats. And each man had a plaster on the left-hand side of his forehead. Now, among those eight men, whom did Grieve identify? He identified Nicholas Talbot. Let us return for a moment to Mrs. Talbot. You will remember that up until now, the accused and his wife had not met. No doubt this accounts for the fact that their stories differed in almost every important particular. Soon after this, they were to meet. We do not know what was said at their first encounter in the detention room. It is perhaps not necessary for us to speculate. The service here is awful. I couldn't get a morning paper. What were the notices like? I didn't look. I was far too worried about you. Now, don't be worried. It's just an idiotic mistake, that's all. But to make matters worse, some fellows now identified me as the man. But that's impossible. How could he? He must have a criminal look, I suppose. 
Anyway, it's time we had a lawyer. That's what I thought. I got Frobisher outside. Good for you. After you left last night, I felt so ashamed. So did I. By the time I'd had my head sewn up, I knew it was just your way of letting off steam. I ought to have laughed you out of it. You know I didn't mean that thing to hit you. Of course you didn't. That's why I did. And I wasn't really in the least bit jealous about Elizabeth. I didn't suppose for a moment that you left the box because of her. It was Casey calling about your autumn tour in the States. He's fixed it for October. That makes me feel very small. Now, oh, listen, my darling. Last night was yesterday. And no good can come of crying about it. If I'd told you about Casey yesterday, this would never have happened. So we're both to blame. Now, you go and get Frobisher. And don't worry. Sooner or later, they're bound to pick up the man who really did it. You are charged that you did on April the 15th last, the 216 Rathbun Mansions murdered Elizabeth Russman, contrary to common law. You are not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be given in evidence. I prefer not to say anything at the moment. You will appear before the magistrate this afternoon. I beg of you, how long is this farce going on? Mrs. Talbot, it's only fair to remind you that you and your husband told conflicting stories to begin with. But even if there was this quarrel on the night of the murder... Even? So you've quite made up your mind Nick did it? The jury will decide that. Can you try, just for a minute, to see it as I see it? I know you're wrong. I know Nick couldn't do it. And I know that all this time there's a real murderer somewhere, putting himself further and further out of your reach. Listen, forget that I was ever in the least bit jealous of Elizabeth. Tell me over again everything you can remember about her. Darling, I have told you. I've got good reason for asking you, Nick. Until she turned up in London recently, no one seems to have seen her for three years. Even the police don't know where she's been. It's terribly important to us to trace those three years. Don't you see that your life may depend on it? Don't you think I'd help you if I could? The police haven't even got a photograph. You haven't got one, have you, Nick? No. I did have a snap, but I tore it up years ago. She may have been living under a different name. But if there was a photograph and they published it in the papers, somebody would be sure to recognize her. Did she ever tell you her plans? Don't think she did. Or her friends? Don't think she had any. None that I knew of, anyway. I'm determined whatever happens to find a photograph. And I'm determined to find out where she's been. You must know something about her, Nick. Think. Try to think. Anything. She might have gone back to Holland. Holland? Yes, she was Dutch. At least her mother was Dutch. Nick, I'm going to Holland. I'm going to try and find her mother. <laughs> I 
daughter was an obstinate child. She wished always to live by her violin. She had no concern for her mother. When did she last write? She hasn't written since three years. Have you a photograph of her? All this I told the police. I have no photograph of her. Perhaps their agent in London will have one. No, I'm afraid I haven't, Miss Shelley. The police have already asked that question and we've made a thorough search. If there was one, it must have been destroyed. Apart from Cotton Garden, what was the last job you got for her? We placed her with the Ladies' Imperial Orchestra. She was one of my first violins. But as I said to the police, I knew very little about her. She was a competent musician and that was all I needed to know. Had she any particular friends in the orchestra? I think Miss Cartwright knew her better than I did. They were very close friends. Oh, yes, I knew Elizabeth very well, but I'm afraid I can't help. As I told the police, she was such a funny girl. She never talked about herself. Mrs. Langridge, our landlady at the time, used to say... One of them quiet ones she was. Kept herself to herself. As I said to the copper, still waters run deep. There was a fellow who used to come and see her. Now, what was his name? I believe you knew a Miss Elizabeth Thrustman, Mr. Shaw. I've said all I've got to say to the police. If you want to know anything, ask them. Everywhere I've been, the police have been first. But I know that you're making the most terrible mistake. The evidence we've got is available to your solicitors. It isn't the evidence you've got. It's the evidence you haven't got. Where's Elizabeth Thrustman been for the last three years? Mrs. Talbot, I'm going to tell you something that, strictly speaking, is off the record. Three years ago, Elizabeth Russman had an illegitimate child. We think she changed the name and lived quietly somewhere where she wasn't known. Where is the child? It died. And the father? Well, he runs a garage. She left him before the child was born. We've seen him. He can't help. May I look at her personal belongings? Certainly. But isn't it rather a forlorn hope? It's the last hope. Like everything else, they're English. She obviously hasn't been abroad. Have you identified these things? The shoes are from a multiple store. The dress is by London Modes, who have shops all over the country, and the nightdress is Celanese. Had she no personal papers? The murderer destroyed them. Was this hers? It was with the others. Looks as though it might be a piece of her own work. I wonder. Do you mind if I take it away with me? I'm afraid I can't let you do that. And may I copy it down? Oh, by all means. Members of the jury, I have very little more to tell you. I have tried to put the case fairly before you. I may at times have spoken with heat. If I have, it is because the ugliness of this crime would move any right-thinking person to indignation and anger. During all my years of practice at the criminal bar, I have seldom known a crime so marked for its ferocity and violence. Deliberately and brutally, the murderer squeezed out the life of his victim with his bare hands. That done, deliberately he set fire to the body, burning the woman he had once loved as callously as he had killed her. Visualize the scene if you will. Mr. Talbot, did you or did you not love Elizabeth Rusper? At one time, I thought I did. I see. 
And when you found out that you didn't, you just slipped away and left her, and that was all, as far as you were concerned. Yes. Yes. Now, during the alleged quarrel on the night of the murder, did your wife learn for the first time of your association with Elizabeth Rusman? I must tell you, Mr. Talbot, that you do not have to answer that question unless you wish. I have no reason for not answering it, my lord. My wife did learn about it for the first time during the quarrel. Do you think she would have married you if she'd have known of it sooner? I'm certain she would. And yet on the occasion she learned of it, according to your own story, she flung something at your head and cut it open. Yes. Yes. Now let us turn to this, uh, this writing on the program. Alas, the love of women. What does that convey to you? It's from Byron. Miss Rusman and I had read Don Juan together, and alas, the love of women had become rather a joke with us. Oh. Perhaps as you read it together, you could remember the last two lines of that stanza. No, I have no idea what they are. Perhaps Elizabeth Rusman expected you to remember. Perhaps. Does it matter? It does indeed. Let me refresh your memory. Alas, the love of women. It is known to be a lovely and a fearful thing. And the stanza ends, and their revenge is as the tiger's spring, deadly and quick and crushing. I put it to you that you were terrified that Elizabeth Rusman was going to try and come between you and your wife. I was not in the least terrified. Mr. Talbot, what is your employment? I act as my wife's manager. So that all the money she earns comes into your hands? It comes through my hands. I take a small percentage for what I do on her behalf, and the rest goes straight into her personal account. Apart from this income from your wife, can you just tell the court what personal money you have? Is that necessary, my lord? I think it's a relevant question. I have about 1,000 pounds in cash and a few shares in a mining syndicate. Not a large fortune, as fortunes go. Not as yours goes, perhaps. <laughs> lord, I ask to be protected from the sarcasm of the witness. You must answer the questions in a proper manner. Yes, my lord, if they are put in a proper manner. This attitude will not help you, Mr. Talbot. Before your marriage, did you have any regular employment? I did a variety of things. I see, a rolling stone. I often worked regularly and hard. But you made no money. I made no money. So that when you met your wife, your financial prospects were not as bright as hers. I didn't marry my wife for her money, if that's what you're suggesting. At that time, she had less than I did. But a big future. If properly managed, yes. But it was not assured. But it was assured on the night that Elizabeth Rusman suddenly appeared at Covent Garden. Yes, I'm glad to say it was. So that in the event of a breakup in your marriage, you stood to lose not merely your wife's affection, but her money as well. I was not interested in her money, and there was no question of a breakup. If there was a breakup, did you or did you not stand to lose financially? I stood to lose far more than that. But you did stand to lose financially. Yes. Thank you. The prosecution suggests that the accused had a motive. I say to you frankly, if the existence of an old love affair were a sufficient motive for murder, almost every man in this court would have such a motive. If you can bring yourselves to believe that such a man would commit a brutal murder for so flimsy a reason, can you also believe that he would be so careless as to advertise his injury near the scene of the crime? The prosecution asks us to believe that Talbot, hurt in the struggle, went at once to the nearest hospital and asked for his wound to be dressed. Look at him in the dock. Look at him closely. I ask you first if he looks like a murderer, and second if he looks like a fool. Remember that on your decision depends a man's life. You and only you can decide if this man shall die or if he shall return to the woman who believes, as I do, so confidently in his innocence. If new facts come to light about this case, as well they may, you, each one of you, will bear the responsibility of sending an innocent man to be hanged. I don't believe you will accept that responsibility. I believe that a verdict of not guilty is the only possible verdict you can return. The prosecution has never at any time suggested that the prisoner cold-bloodedly planned his crime. These things occur in heat and passion. And I submit to you, 
Uh, when my learned friend suggested that you should ask ourselves whether the accused looked like a murderer, he's attempting to obscure the issue. Who knows what a murderer should look like? I ask you to confine yourselves not to appearances, but to facts. The prisoner had a motive, and a motive which, as my learned friend has pointed out to you, is one which will be widely understood. The prisoner is unable to furnish an alibi. He tells conflicting stories to account for his movements. He is identified by the only person who saw the murderer leave the apartment. His silver pencil is found lying near the dead woman's body. These are the facts, members of the jury, facts. Short of an actual witnessing of the crime, what more could you have? Justice demands that you shall find Nicholas Talbot guilty. I think, Sir Alfred, that that would be a suitable point at which to adjourn for today. Yes, Your Lordship, please. Let's face it, things aren't going so well. Let Richard counsel and his cheap sneers. Cheap but effective. Oh, I don't think so. Really, I don't. No one's impressed by that sort of thing these days. Oh, Wells knows his juries. He's painted my past in the most lurid colors and planted firmly in their minds that I live off him. Well, there's the whole weekend for that to sink in. Then on Monday, you'll really go to town. But you don't live off me, Nick. You know you don't. Oh, I know. You and I don't think of it like that. But they seem to twist everything, sir. Oh, darling, I felt that too. It's all so fantastic. It's not you they're talking about. Not us. Nothing like us. You have a few love affairs when you're young, and at the time they seem gay and romantic. But if one of them comes home to roost, it looks vulgar and tawdry. Everything looks tawdry in a court of law. No, darling. Not everything. I want you to promise me something. Promise me that if anything should go wrong... I know what you're going to say. But nothing will go wrong. You mustn't be anxious. It's certain to be all right. I'm not a bit worried. We're both of us horribly worried. Then let's waste each few minutes pretending we're not. Everything here is unreal. We mustn't be. I know. These minutes are all that count. And they're so short. And getting shorter. Time's up, Mrs. Talbot. Joan sent her love. I'm spending the weekend with them. Next week we'll go down together. Of course we will. Goodbye, my love. you were good at geography. Get an atlas and look it up. I don't believe you know. What's that you're whistling? What's that you're whistling? What's what? That tune. Where did you hear it? Why, well, you just played it, Aunt Philippa. Yes, but you couldn't remember it like that on one hearing. You got it perfectly. Where did you hear it? I can't remember. Try to think, Leslie. This was the tune. Listen. Bungie Baker had on the brain in the Christmas halls. Who's Bungie Baker? He's a friend of Leslie's. He spent Christmas with us. I suppose I did have it on the brain a bit last Christmas. We had it drummed into us at breaking up time. And it's got a sort of catchy air. What's the name of your school? Penmare. That's the name of the village, too. It's in Scotland. About 40 miles from Edinburgh. I haven't heard this tune before. Is it a special one for your school? Oh, yes, it's quite new. Someone wrote it at the school. One of the boys? Uh, no, one of the masters, I think. 
I'm afraid I don't quite understand what the importance of this tune is, Mrs. Talbot. It may not be important. It's just that... Well, thank you for your information, Bungie. And thank you for letting me see him. We're only too glad we were able to help. This man, this master, he might be the one link we've been looking for. How did the manuscript come to be in Elizabeth's case? He must have known her. Exactly. I'm going to the school to see him. Yes, it makes sense, but don't let's bank too much on it. We won't. But it's a chance and I'm taking it. I'm catching the night train to Edinburgh. If I'm not back on Monday, don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Keep your fingers crossed. I will. Hello? Is that Pemmer School? May I speak to the headmaster, please? I'm sorry, ma'am. Mr. Fleming's out. No, he won't be back till this evening. What name shall I say? Mrs... Mrs. Newcomb. Yes, that's right. Newcomb. I'm in Edinburgh for the day, and I wanted to look over the school. Do you think he would see me this evening? I'm sure he will, ma'am. I'll tell him you're coming. He'll be back about six. The headmaster's house is room there to the right, ma'am. Thank you. Will you wait here? Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, sir. That'll be Mrs. Newcomb now, I'm thinking, sir. Just a moment. I... Uh, I'll answer the door myself. Very good, sir. What did you say her name was? Mrs. Newcomb, sir. You sure it was Newcomb? Oh, I'm quite sure. I wrote it down. Mrs. Turnbull. Yes, sir. I shan't need you any more this evening. You can go. But uh, your supper, sir? I'm going out tonight. I won't want any supper. Oh, very well, sir. Good evening. Can I help you? I beg your pardon. Are you Mr. Fleming? I am. I'm so sorry. I rang the bell, but there was no reply. Do forgive me. I wanted to see you about sending my son to your school. I see. I came personally because I thought I would like to see the school for myself. It's so necessary, I think, to make sure. Yes. 
Mrs. Newcomb. Mrs. Newcomb. I should be delighted to show you around when would be a convenient time. I've got to be back in London tomorrow morning. I'm leaving on the night train. Could we make it now? Very good. I'll get the keys. Most of the buildings are locked up during holidays. This is one of the junior classrooms. Are you musical, Mr. Fleming? No. I noticed a piano in your sitting room. I should like John to take music lessons. Cantley's our music master. No doubt you saw his name in the prospectus. No, I haven't had a prospectus. I came to Edinburgh on a family matter and I thought I'd like to call while I was near. I see. The dormitories are above the classroom. I expect you'd like to see one. Yes, I would. Thank you. I expect the masters are all away during the holidays. Yes. Don't you find it rather quiet after the noise and bustle of term time? I like the quiet, Mrs. Newcomb. Are you looking for someone you know? The Henry Baker's boy, Benjamin. It was really through them that I found out about the school. You'll find him in that group over there. Oh, yes, there he is. Is that your wife? No. That's the matron. You are married, aren't you? My wife is abroad at the moment. I shall look forward to meeting her. Is she in any of the school groups? No. There seems to be one year missing. The negative was damaged that year. No photograph was issued. I see. I should like you to see the chapel before you go. How long have you been headmaster here? Five years. But I'm leaving at the end of next year. I'm sorry. I shall be sorry too, in a way. It wasn't really a very good school when I came. It's been a great pleasure watching it grow. But I've been offered the headmastership of Lovell's College. It's a great opportunity. You like your work? Yes, I love teaching. It's the only thing in the world that matters to me. May I try the organ? Oh, by all means. Thank you. You'll find the switch on the right hand side. What a pleasant tune this is. How lucky you are to have it for a school song. Who wrote it? Who wrote it?
The song is based on an old Dutch folk tune. Dutch? Then how do you... It makes a very good school song, I think. Don't you? Yes, very. Well, I... I better be going, or else I shall miss that train. Of course. Thank you very much for giving me so much of your time. I'm glad I've been able to help. I'll write to you when I get back to London. Please do. You don't have to see me any further. I can find my own way out. Very well. Goodbye, Mrs. Newcomb. Goodbye. Do you happen to know who takes the school photographs? Yes, ma'am. That'll be Angus Baird, just up the village. Would you mind taking me there, please? Well, tonight, ma'am? Yes, please. Oh, very good, ma'am. Mr. Baird? Aye? Forgive me for troubling you on a Sunday, but I'm very anxious to obtain some photographs of the school. Aye, and if I... you come around at 9 o'clock in the morning, the shop will be open and you can see them in a proper manner. I wonder if you could let me have them tonight. I've got to catch a train for London. I neither buy nor sell on the Sabbath day. I don't mind what I pay. I have no interest in money until tomorrow morning. It's six. I may never take it a moment, please. Hello. Hello. Oh, good evening, sir. I'm sorry to disturb you on your Sunday evening. But there was someone here today inquiring about the school groups. Uh, have you by any chance had anyone in to see you? Yes, sir. There was a lady here just now and she was inquiring about school photographs. But I didn't sell her any. I think she wanted a copy of the group you took last year. But she won't be able to have that one, will she, Baird? That's what I thought. Did she say she'd call again? I told her to come back in the morning. I told her that I neither buy nor sell on the Sabbath day. I, I hope that you agree that I did right, sir. Yes, yes, of course. You did quite right, Baird. Well, I'm sorry you won't be able to help her. Uh, is there anything else, Mr. Fleming? No, no, that's all. Thank you very much. Good night. It's nine o'clock. Good morning. Good morning. Have you by any chance a copy of the Penn Mare School Group for last year? I have not. Can you tell me where I can get one? There is no one. Oh, it's so important to me. Is there by any I chance... I tell you, my girl, there is no one. Thank you. I think we kept one of the proofs, Angus. If that would be of any use to the lady. Oh, it would. I'm sure it would. You'll ruin my good name, woman. It's a sore point with her, ma'am. He's usually very careful, but he forgot to lock the dark room door. Oh. Here it is. exactly what I want. I can't thank you enough. May I take it? Certainly, ma'am. How much do I owe you? Oh, we wouldn't have charged you for that, ma'am. Annie, that'll be half a crown. Well, goodbye. And once again, thank you very much. I'm sure you're very welcome, ma'am. I have a very important phone call to make before I catch the train. Doing my best, miss. Uh, which platform?
where does the London train go from? This one, miss. Ten o'clock. Thank you. Where is the telephone? Front the right. Hello? I want trunks, please. It's no good you trying that one, Dax. Why not? Out of order. And I just can't wait to have a lousy, long chat. What did you say? Oh, Doris Taylor. Oh, yes, yes, I heard about it. It's dreadful. It seems only last week. Thank you. Have your London evening paper, please. Sorry. A local one? made you think I wouldn't recognize you? How did you trace her? How did you trace her? A school song. It was in our music case. What are you going to do? I shouldn't if I were you. I've been to inquire if they serve teas in the train. They'll be starting in a few minutes. Oh, will they? Did you say something? I said, oh, will they? I'm afraid I'm very deaf. I can't hear what you say. It's a great handicap, you know. Which way is the restaurant car? Which way? is the restaurant car. What are you going to do? You killed her, didn't you? Yes, I killed her. Why? I killed her because if I hadn't, she would have destroyed the only thing I have left in life, the only thing I care about, my work. You see, she was going to divorce me for cruelty. Not because I'd been cruel, but because she hated me. She only married me because she knew she couldn't get your husband. She was still in love with him. Perhaps that will help you to understand why I don't care what happens to him. Divorce for cruelty would have finished me. She knew that. She wanted to finish me. And so you made up your mind to strangle her? No. I didn't intend to kill her. I went there that evening to reason with her. But I have a dangerous temper. She knew that. She knew my weakness. She kept at it like someone drilling on a nerve. I can see her now. 
I'll never forget him. I saw him tonight. I'm going to see him again. I'm going to get him back. His marriage won't last. He'll get sick of playing second fiddle to her, and I shall be free of you by then. It would ruin me. Sir, if you're right, if it does, I shall mind. I know it's got to finish, but it could be done decently. Decently? That's all you care about, the little tin god with his wonderful gift of teaching. Be careful, Elizabeth. His wife divorced his headmaster for cruelty. What would the parents say to that? Be careful, Elizabeth. You and your high moral standards. Getting letters from people all over the place, thanking you for turning their sons into prigs and hypocrites like yourself. Be quiet. Those letters that have seen you lapping them up. Be you quiet. Won't anymore, and you won't get that job at Lovell's. Be quiet, I tell you. Be quiet. Talk, no school on earth will have you. <laughs> She was quiet. She was quiet in the end. I couldn't believe it had happened. Then I realized I was free. I had made myself free. You'll never be free from that. I should like that photograph, Mrs. Talbot. What photograph? The one you bought in Penmare this morning. I posted it to Scotland Yard. I tell you, I posted it to Scotland Yard. does it make? You can't escape from what you did. I had done so, until you came. I wanted to see you, Mrs. Talbot. Sit down. Please, Inspector, I must tell you what's happened. I won't keep you a moment. I've got a great deal to tell you, Inspector Archer. I... I'm so sorry. Yes. Yes, all right. Yes, as soon as possible. Right. Now, Mrs. Talbot. I've no longer got proof of what I'm going to tell you, but there must be something... I think I already know what you're going to tell me. This is what I've been waiting for. Let me introduce Detective Sergeant Hawkins. Detective? Yes, Mrs. Talbot. This is Fleming's confession. Made to you in my hearing on the train. It's all we needed. Get me the Central Criminal Court quickly. I want to get a message through to the clerk of the court. Mm -hmm. 